Uh, my name is Christopher Dolder. I am a professor of dance at uh, Southern Methodist University, the Meadows School of the Arts. Um, I was a dancer for Martha Graham from 1985 through 1991, her very last six years. I was uh, the very one of the last seven that were with her in her very last piece when she passed away, which was a very, very, very intense, intense time. Um, I left uh, Martha's company just basically oh, a few months after she passed. Uh, I went and got my graduate degree at Mills College in Oakland, California, and proceeded to teach at UC Berkeley as a dance lecturer for 15 years, so 1991 through 2006. And then I got very um, burned out on academia and all the politics of academia, as did my wife. We, had three, we have three kids. They were two, five, and seven at the time. So I said, let's quit our jobs. Let's move to Maui. I want to buy this farm. I want to rehabilitate a macadamia farm and build my own house. So that's what we did. <laughs> so we, uh, I had remodeled a few homes in a row, and so we built up a little capital, and so we just did this grand experiment. And so for three years, my kids got to go to Wailuku Elementary, and we lived in Wailuku, Hawaii. And uh, I was a macadamia farmer, and I didn't dance for three years. I, was, I, uh, I ran a business called All Trades Repair and Remodel. So I would either fix your toilet or, or build you a pagoda, but it was 50 bucks an hour. Wow. Didn't matter, it's the same rate. Doesn't matter what it is, man. It's 50 bucks an hour. So, uh, and I got to a... Uh, have my dream of building my own home. I it was uh, just, you know, 16 foot open beam ceiling, four foot unsupported eaves, and then sculpt the land. My grandparents lived and died in Maui, so we were able to transfer a lot of their old uh, banana trees, et cetera, to the property. because so the idea was to make like a three crop macadamia bananas and dwarf citrus. Uh, and then that, that experiment just exploded in 2008 when everything else exploded. <laughs> and uh, looks like and it was all going to just crumble. And out of the blue, providentially, I was uh, um, sent an email by Southern Methodist University, and they were looking for someone who uh, was uh, a chief research was in dance kinesiology, but was also could teach the Martha Graham technique. Generally, those don't end up in the same body. One is hard biomechanical science, and the other is crazy metaphorical drama. <laughs> uh, and yet, they also wanted someone who had uh, a skills uh, in dance and camera. And I almost thought it was a joke because I had been out of the business for three years, and yet that was my resume. Like that, their job description was my resume. So I wrote back and said, uh, "Well." Um, this is my skill set. I have these abilities, but be aware for the last three years I've been running a macadamia farm and I'm basically a repairman. But they, they said, well, then please send us your resume. And so I stayed up a full night, 24 hours, and put in all my philosophies and pedagogies and various dances that I'd choreographed. Um, I used to have my own company in New York when I was dancing for Martha called Christopher Dolder and Friends. So I sent them this whole package 24 hours later, and then they sent me an invitation to come interview. And I flew out here. I'd never been to Dallas in my life. Uh, interviewed and it just was meant to be. Everybody I met was just, it was, I got this really deep connection and I've now been here five years and I just finished what's called my tenure track and uh, I will find out in March whether I get the, you get to stay here forever or <laughs> see you later, don't come back. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. But uh, so this, this uh, documentary, Meadows at the Windspear Ride of Spring, at least also services both as my art, but it also services as my publishing because one of my lines of research is in, uh, you know, dance and camera. So my chief line of research is in dance kinesiology, then secondary is dance and emerging cultures. So um, are you familiar with the Burning Man Festival? So uh, yes, I am a burner, I admit it. I've been there 11 times. Uh, and for the last four years, I've been filming a documentary called The Ecstatic Dance of Burning Man. And it's basically uh, an examination of the emergence and evolution of various sub dance subcultures throughout the history of the event. So that will premiere at the Burning Man Festival this next year. I didn't go to go this year because I'm playing good boy and being the, you know, you know, staying here for tenure. <laughs> uh, but next year I will. Yes. So there it is. There's it in a nutshell. <laughs> so tell us how the, um, uh, how it all came about to do Rite of Spring and to do it in this very avant-garde way. Well, we, uh, Every, every two years, every three years, we do the Meadows at the Windspear. It's a big gala event, and it's actually for um, phil phil philanthropists to come to give money for the Meadows Scholars Program. So it's a combination of the Meadows uh, Orchestra, run by Paul Phillips, and dance. And uh, each three years, we just really think of like, what are the, what are the, what's a great show? And that this year, we decided to do Rite of Spring. It was actually 2013, based on the centennial. It was 100 years from the time of the premiere. 
but we wanted to look for a very different form of Rite of Spring. So we went searching around um, throughout Europe and we uh, came across this man, Joost Vrauenratz, and he's part of a company called Gotra Ballet. He's a previous uh, dancer with Maurice Bejar, but he's very avant-garde. Like if you just go go Google Joost Vrauenratz and Gotra Ballet, and it's, he's, he's really much into manga and uh, superheroes, and he really in, he inter intersperses it with his work. And, uh, He's, um, he's kind of like a 14-year-old kid genius, even though he's in his 30s. He's just this wiry guy. And, uh, and no, one, no one wanted to be the rehearsal director for him because they had heard that he was such a kind of a crazy guy. And so that was leveled on me being the one that could, you know, I'm, I'm the avant-garde, so yes. So. <laughs> and at first we kind of had a meeting with each other and we're both kind of like, I don't know you and you didn't ask me to work for you. And we both we had this meeting of like, I don't know what we're going to do here. And I just said, look, let's just, I'll come to rehearsals. You have a rehearsal assistant, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be a babysitter. Uh, but I'll just be there and we'll just see how it, how it happens. And it really, within a few days, he would look over and he'd come, or well, I, well, after at the end of each rehearsal, he'd come over and ask me what I thought. And I just gave him the whole perception of what I saw and what I feel he was doing. And his eyes would just brighten up completely because we really connected on a very abstract level to where I could narrative his abstract and that's what he was thinking in his head and so we we got this bond it became very very quick and very strong bless you and um and at the same time i was uh filming i just i'm always capturing film i love to film so i'm always just capturing uh things anyway because i wanted to capture my students in the process and then he asked me well well are, you know i see you're using the camera are you used to doing that and i said well i've been working in video for about 35 years when you used to actually cut it with tape and get them rolling at the same <laughs> speed and thank you non-linear editing final cut pro days but uh, he, I, so I showed him some of my work, and he sent it to his company, and then they sent me a contract and says, can you, can you do this making of documentary? But wow, so I was the, I'm the teacher of the students, I was the dramaturge for the production, and then I was also the documentarian. So it was a bit of an intense juggle. And uh, so then, yeah, and so then it was uh, throughout the process, just uh, both documenting, but at the same time coaching, and, uh, and then, then I put it all together, and here we are. How did the students react and what was their perception of it? The students at first, I mean, his process is um, multiple, multiple experiments and explorations and repetition. And so it, it was exhaustive for the students. I and mean, we work our students hard. And I've always tell, I'm, I'm the endurance man. I'm the dance kinesiologist. So I'm constantly getting them ready for this. Well, it worked him. And he was, and he was, it was hard. We would do four hour rehearsals and I would have to make him stop. And the students would just, they were just exhausted. I mean, biomechanically and psychologically as well. But they were also quite energized because within this, they were, they were being given a movement palette that's the lineage of Maurice Bejar. At the same time, Joost has actually um, taken many classes in the Graham technique, so really the movement uh, vocabulary, the lineages were really Martha Graham meets Maurice Bejar meets this like 14-year-old guy who likes comic books. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was pretty an interesting confluence of, uh, of, uh, of you know, aesthetics, as it were. And can you break down uh, the Martha Graham technique versus the uh the majority technique. Well, I mean, I could, I could if I go. I mean, I could do piece by piece, saying, well, that lineage, you know, this is more Graham based, and this is more, you know, Bejar based. But it would, it would, you know, I'd have to go through and be like, well, there it is, and there it is, and there it right. is. But one of the commonalities between them is, is this very visceral core. It's not really distal initiated. It really is core initiated and out. And and there's a lot of torque involved. So through Maurice, the torque would end up in balletic contemporary ballet patterns, and in Martha, there was, you know, abstract modern art. So those both informed very well the intensity of the work. It really is centrally driven beyond also just um, metaphorically passionate from a, from a deep, very personal place. Yeah. As a uh, dancer and now film, how I'm just interested in how you blend. I mean, I know what you want to see, yeah. but you as a dancer, Certain well, you, you control, I mean, you know, there's so much power in the lens. There's so much power in the framing of what you see. And this, what, you know, what people will see is this documentary version, this edited version, is going to be different than anything they saw live. So even the people who saw it live are going to get a different show because I'm choosing to be the close-up on the chosen one. I'm choosing for the puppet to be this big in the screen and be that much more intimidating. So you're able to really manipulate the, uh, the amplitudes 
uh, beyond the context, the amplitudes of what you're, what you're showing. So it's, it's a, I, I'm, I'm hoping, I mean, Yost is very pleased with it, and it's, it's another version of his work. And it does, uh, and it has its own kind of, um, I get to control a little bit of the drama, as it, mm -hmm. were, as it were. But at the same time, knowing fully, full well what he would like, so he was really excited when he saw the version of it. He was like, wow, that's, you know, one more take on it. Yeah. While you were going through the lens, I mean, you're choosing, as you said, your view through that camera lens. How did that adjust your view as the job of the dramaturg? Um, actually, it, to, truthfully, it didn't have an effect on it because it, it was really, one is, when I'm behind the camera, uh, I'm, I'm almost like the camera. I'm the mechanism. I already have the aesthetic of what I'm looking for, so I'm, I'm that mechanism. I don't have, I'm, I'm, I'm turning off the brain as to, is this contextually accurate? Is this, you know, is this uh, redundant or is this, is this supportive and all? I, I turn that part of the brain off. I really become the cameraman and I, I step away from the dramaturg completely because at that point you're, Contemplating, oh, shot's gone. <laughs> you know, that's too many brains. Is there a time with that job that it took you back to, oh, well, I'm going to look at my footage? Uh, no, no, I never once looked at any of the footage throughout the process of the making of. I, I just simply filmed everything. And, and one of the greatest challenges, in which I can let you in on the secret, uh, is, well, even w with the context of that, it looks like a multi-camera shoot. No, that's a, those are all single camera shoots with me behind the camera. So, and, and in, when you actually see at the Windspear itself, uh, the, the tempi of the live orchestra version at the Windspear was uh, erratic in, compared to the canned music that we used at the Hope, and yet at seven of the performances that I filmed at the Hope inform 60% of the material that's being put into the, quote, Meadows at the Windspear. So it was, it was a challenge to get them to sync up, because sometimes they'd be like, oh, that's the perfect shot, and they realize, oh my god, I've got like, you know, point tenth of a second or whatever that doesn't line up and I would have to blur the lines a little bit. So in a, in a way I was kind of distorting uh, in essence how the dancers dance to what beat at times to, uh, to play with it. And only once did I have to really digitally kind of mess with the timing and I had to make it a little slower than it was and it's, uh, you know, if you really look there's a section where that's not quite real time. But, <laughs> but it, it, I think, it, I would suggest very few people will catch that. But bless them all. Bless <laughs> See, the amount of hours that it took because of that. I mean, had it just been a multi-camera shoot, I could just go through. But to weave that all into just the, let alone the documentary portion, but to weave that all into that edited version took, oh, I can't even tell, I won't even go into it, but it's over, it's over a couple hundred hours, you know. It was, Which, what camera do you use to shoot with? I use an AGAF-100, it's a Panasonic AGAF-100, it's an interchangeable lens camera, it's a, uh, what's called a micro two-thirds lens, and so you can, actually with the right kind of mounts, you can even put a big old Panavision lens on it. It's a cool camera, because I, I wrote grants uh, uh, last few years, and it was interesting, because I'm writing grants for this equipment that even film and media didn't get, and they were gonna, they, they're getting all jealous of me, because I have a be better camera, but I'm like, go write the grants, because I was writing them for other purposes for kinesiology as well, but that camera, uh, I basically shot that all with two lenses. I have a, 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 a 20 millimeter prime, but it's super fast. It's like 1.7 uh, f-stop, and 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 some of the crispness and the and the, that shallow depth of field I was able to get with that is it was was pretty cool. And then also then a longer lens um, zoom 4140. So sometimes you'll see that catch zoom. But with that camera, you have to pull focus and zoom at the same time. And so there were a lot of misses, as it were. You're like, blur. <laughs> so, or sometimes it was perfect. The dancer's running at me, and I timed the, the, zo the, the unzoom and, then, and the focus at the same time. And she, she'd stay in focus the whole time, and yet it's all blurred behind her. So it was, uh, some of those were like, thank you. That was, that was lucky timing. So I, I, I worked those as, as well as I could into it. You know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, stop, uh, Paul, orchestra, please. Can you run it? Yeah. No, you don't. You don't get a second chance, and particularly for the Windspear one, because again, that was the base for the the, the base palette that everything had to go onto. And then, and I had to think to myself, well, where am I going to get to film? And that was a packed, packed house. And miraculously, just over house right was this big pillar, and there was this one chair that, whatever for whatever reason, no one was is movable. And I thought, hallelujah. So that's where that's where I shot, and that's where I was able to actually at one point capture the orchestra and capture the dancing all together. 
And to me, that was one of my favorite shots. Like there, there's this massive, there, here's Paul Phillips and the whole thing is melding as one. And to me, being that's where I was not the dramaturge or even the cameraman. There was a moment of like, this is a great seat. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> I love this seat. I, I, what I should have mentioned there, that is probably my, one of my favorite absolute spots because it's got a great view of stage. But like, like you said, that one seat with that pillar right That's there. That's it. It's like, it's like, it's like, okay, all y'all are, are there, but I don't have to worry about you. It's true. It's a sweet spot. It really is. I can stand up. I can sit down. Yeah. Nobody's going to yell at me. Yes, exactly, exactly. And there's only one, actually, there's only one shot of the entire documentary that I did not shoot is I had a friend um, with uh, another camera I have, which is called an HMC, Panasonic HMC 150, which is a great run and gun because you get zoom and it pulls focus at the same time, not as crisp. Well, there's one center shot where there's, they're, they're all in a row, yes? So that, and I, that I, I used maybe three seconds of it. So there was a second cameraman. <laughs> it's a three second fix shot. Chris, can you talk a little bit about, you know, 2013 was the 100th anniversary of the Rite of Spring, and can you just sort of uh, give us a little explanation of why the original was so controversial, and then maybe some of the other versions you experienced? Well, the, the, the original, because for this was... Um, this was performance art. This was Diaghilev as a producer saying, let's bring in all these really, really edgy artists and with Nijinsky and Nijinska and creating a vocabulary that was just antithetical to ballet. This whole turned in, stomp, stomp, and even the original costumes, which were more based on the northern steppes, uh, um, native, native people in the upper, I guess, Russia. Uh, this, this was all very non-traditional, not what people expected. But one of the bylines to, because I don't know if you all know that there was a riot, it was the opening night in, to, to, uh, in Paris. Well, there's the, yes, the story is there was a riot, but it, actually Diaghilev staged that. Diaghilev put students, he put these like real progressive turn of the century students next to the wealthy elite that were going there, and purposely placing them in the front rows. So they started fighting about, you know, oh, this is terrible. No, but it's the best. And so they, he, you know, Diaghilev knew what he was doing. Diaghilev was a, he was a manipulator. He was a producer. Uh, I, did, I did a lot of research on him actually when I was in graduate school. And I, I and so, yeah, so that, that, that topicality, yes, it was built into the piece. But at the same time, there was some, you know, there was some other stuff going on in and around that. Yeah, but it was, but it certainly was contextually more kind of performance art rather than traditional, you know, classic theater dance. Whereas in this version, the, the topicality was uh, using the use of these uh, parochial school costumes. That's pretty edgy when all of a sudden the virgin is one of your, I mean, I have a 15 year old daughter. And all of a sudden when that, that, that proverbial chosen one is in that costume, that kind of hits home in this day and age. In addition to, the fact is, is that the, the burgeoning of sexuality, because there are these sexual themes throughout it because of the concept of procreation, you kill so that we can continue to procreate. These are all very relative and contextual. It's the contemporary tribe. And that, that was, when we first were doing that, uh, he was rehearsing, he had a scene with the puppet where the puppet, in, it was, basically it was an abstracted rape. And it was too edgy. I mean, it was at, at that point, and it was in the greenhouse, and I just said to, to Yost, I understand how intense you're, try, you're trying to go with this, but at a certain point, we can't go, we can't go that far. You know, and so that's the kind of the relationship. I didn't want to pull him back, but I was the, we had to kind of navigate it back. And yet he found, I think, a, a, a way that it worked out well, that this symbolically it's there, but it's not crass, and it's not over the top. Uh, but at the same time, it hits home. It really does. And, yeah, it is still edgy. And actually, when it, around that time, we were being interviewed, and I'm fielding, uh, uh, fielding interviews, and I'm just trying to, like, <laughs> trying to like, not tell them everything that's going on, but then people are asking, and I thought, it's going to be, it's gonna be dodgy. Yeah, but it's, I think we, uh, we, just, we just squeaked under that, that limit, and I, and I honestly feel that, I don't know if any of you saw it at the Windspear, but, uh, I mean, it was, it, was, it was a spectacular success. It was, it, it was the audience just, it was a full-on standing ovation, loved it, grabbed, them, grabbed it. So it was, and it could have been a huge miss. It could have been the people walking out thing. There's no question about it. Yeah. Well, talk about the choice for, for the costuming, um, where, where that came from and how y'all... It came, you know, came, well, for, for, Yost, for Yost, the costuming came from his, his love for graphic novels, for, for comics, for manga, and that whole sense of like, the, you know, the, 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 you know, 
basically the, the, the parochial school costume and where it's, it's ended up in comic books, etc. Mm -hmm. um, he just, he, he feels an affinity. He, he's like a 14 year old kid. And so he feels an affinity to this age group. And so he uh, basically, that, that's kind of where that stemmed from. At one point, before he got that point, he was thinking of Armani suits and these, these Versace dresses. So that was a major, blinded, major, <laughs> major shift. Um, and based on the fact that he was just wanting to get back to what he really was into, which was the manga comic book look. So that was, that was the, so basic. And then, and he, we had some very strong discussions about this and I was giving, telling him of all the, the pitfalls, the dangers of really that, of, of taking on the iconography of the middle school, parochial school, private school costumes. And then he liked it. Like when he, when he started hearing like, wow, that might push a few more buttons, but you know, cause he's that way. He's, he's, a, he's a provocateur in that, in that sense. I had felt like the costume in that, specifically in the, in, you know, the, the, the actual storylines of the right screen, in, in the way that it merged. I, the whole time I was watching it, having grown up in Dallas, I was thinking, oh my lord, that's in you. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It was, it was uh, um, well, and, I, and truthfully, part of that is, and unfortunately he has not left, but Dean Bowen, Antonio Bowen, our Dean, he, um, I wish, I, I so wish him luck, but I wish he had stayed because I think he, he, in a five year time, six year time, has been really, in my, in my mind, changing the culture uh, of SMU to become that much more progressive and contemporary. I mean, he hired a macadamia farmer, you know, <laughs> to be a dance teacher. And yet, you know, and yet, but at the same time, had faith in me and my chief research is in dance kinesiology, where I'm developing a uh, a theoretical new lab where I take um, uh, infrared depth mapping and pressure sensing, not force, but pressure sensing, to create basically what are algorithmic models, uh, basically geometric algorithmic models of humans. So I'm making actually a digital gravity. So I'm making an avatar space where instead of it just being the vision of a person, it's actually the biomechanical information of that person. And so then we're going to, and so we will, I will be able to output it in kinesiological text or you see it in avatar form, or you go into the lab, I capture you, and whatever you do is now that avatar, so you can play with your own avatar in real space. I mean, in other words, it, if you break it in there, you're gonna break it in reality. So uh, next, next Friday, I'm, I'm, uh, I was hired by, uh, we have Larry Brown, by the way, I don't know if people know Larry Brown as far as basketball. Well, uh, he's hired me as the, he kept on hearing about the crazy dance teacher teaching his athletes, so he hired me to be a stretch coach for the men's basketball. And so then, so now I, uh, then I told him about my research. Well, next Friday I'm getting mechanical engineers, Larry Brown's athletes, dancers, and exercise physiologists, uh, and I have this company bringing a $500,000 turnkey system because even they were like, "Why do you need pressure and 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 infrared depth mapping?" And they didn't even understand it. But they said, "Wow, I talked my way up to the president, and they're bringing this $500,000 lab next Friday, and we're going to take four constituencies and put that lab to test, you know, put it to work." So again, it's about new contemporary multidisciplinary you know cross those campus lines and not not stay in your own insular place so that's that's what I, Jose has brought to Meadows and I'm, I'm hoping to be continuing to push that push the limits of what was originally your insular job duty and say no let's cross those lines and let's find some more uh, you know let's, let's get more people at the table Oh, this is a this this is a wonderful place to be for me right now. There's no question about it. I've got a 17-year-old, a 15-year-old, an 11-year-old. Uh, we live. I live a block from campus, so I ride my bike. I go to the gym. My kids go to the, one of the best high schools in the nation. And if all goes well and I get my tenure, they get to go to SMU for free. So I mean, I just and 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 with the concept that uh, Jose has put the continuity in Meadows is that I write the grants and I'm getting the money to get the best camera, getting the money. To, I have a, I have a $10,000 pressure mat. It's, I call it my $10,000 floor mat. It has 4,600 sensors. And now my students in kinesiology will stand on that. They'll see the, the foot or orth the orthopedic individuation of their feet, like a topo topo topography map. And they can start to make extrapolations of, well, maybe the hip is a length, maybe it's twisted. So they're using cutting edge contemporary data to actually see what's going on in their own bodies, which they never did before. And so at that point, to be able to merge to science with art is, it, and SMU is making that happen. And I mean, this is, and I taught at Berkeley for 15 years where people get so insular that you're not getting that crossover. So as far as I'm concerned, SMU is doing 
pretty much what, I mean, I would think the best university in the nation could do. I mean, it really is investigating through non-traditional crossovers. I think you're going to see a lot more of your sports uh, coaches coming to talk to you after. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's good. I mean, Especially the, the basketball players, I agree, but, but the, the, even the baseball players and, and, and the football players learning what they're doing hey, wrong. Football player, I, have, uh, I, I designed a modern dance class for the athletes. I started it last summer and I had it this summer. And, you know, first these athletes come in and they're pretty street and they're just like, you know, what are you going to teach me? And within a week, they're like, oh, my God, this is much harder than I thought. And, I, and the stretching and this guy, Robert Seals, he's a linebacker. He, uh, he, I get him off the last day because they wanted to see families and all that, but he came the last day anyway. And I said, Robert, what are you here? And he says, I just got to get one more stretching. He said, my, four, my 40 time, he was, dropped from a 4.75 to a 4.4 in four weeks because of his stretching. Because I told him, theoretically, he thought his coaches were because he had a slow start. And I said, no, your hamstrings are so tight in relationship to your hip flexors, you're creating a wobble. The faster you run, it's creating this warble. The, would you get this smooth line where your hip flexors aren't in opposition, meaning tightening? He improved his timing in one month from a 4.75 to a 4.4. And that's the reality. Like, at the, this, is contempor this is contemporary biomechanics and athletics, but that's what dance is. It just, you know, at least the athletic athletes don't have to do it with style. <laughs> they don't have to, like, how, you know, how beautiful was your touchdown? No, but it's, it's the biomechanics or the crossover. They, they, they are the, we're the same human being. Well, you know, they've done that in film several times where they, they've had the, the, they've made the football players go and, and sit down with the, the, the dance coaches and then they pirouette through lines. And yeah. Hey, so Lynn Swan, most, one of the most prolific wide receivers in the NFL's history was a Took That's right, and it, it, well, Herschel Walker did that experiment, and Jerry Jones just actually is had a having a, a, a yoga studio built, you know, in his facilities. You know, like, hey, Jerry, uh, I can stretch you guys out. <laughs> it's like, there's some money, but no, <laughs> but no, it's it's it is. This is the 21st century, and if you go into a gym, right, you will see 99.9% .9 of that gym for contracting muscles and a tiny little mat for stretching out. And, it, and that, that's old, that's like, that's like the, the dark ages. Yeah, and, and really, there's a, the, one of the most progressive machines in the gym at Deadman right now. It's called a true stretch, and it's this cage. And, you can, and most people, it has a list, with, and most people don't know what to do. And I'm, I'm, the, I'm known as the weird guy who stretches, because I go on that, I'll spend 40 minutes on that machine, and by the end of 20 minutes each side, I have my arms up here, but my leg is up here. So, I mean, I can get, you know, and it's, it's because, well, I've been doing it forever, but that machine allows you to torque and release and find places that are not just a floor or a bar or a bungee cord, you know. So, it, there should be more of those. There's, there, you know, not should, it's a strong word. It would behoove us to come into the 21st century and start to make more devices for stretching out so they, they can compensate for strength, you know, the whole sense of contraction. So, yeah, it's, it's, my, it's contemporary. And we all need Yes. Oh, hey, back operations in America? Yeah, tell you what, we can, we, can, we can cut those by half if we just get people to engage their core and start to stretch out. That alone, engage your core and stretch out your hamstrings, we will reduce back injuries. You know, simple as that. I mean, it's physics. It's, it's, it's all there. We just haven't really been making ourselves responsible for it yet. Yeah, that'll be the day when you see all of us going. <laughs> <laughs> that and yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll be that hopefully that's the day like finally I'm like 99 and I look around and at least five ten percent of the population is stretching I'm like I'm good I'm done. Yeah. journey <laughs> over <laughs> Martha Graham it's true no uh, Martha Graham was she she came in rehearsal one time she was 92 at the time she could be a real evil, mean woman. She could be a really mean woman. But this time she came and she's angry and she could barely walk. She storms up to the bar and she bottomals her leg way above her head and slams it down on the ground or on the bar, whips her head back and says, that's how it's done. And we, she's 92. And we, without thinking, every one of us just dropped to the floor because we were so overwhelmed with what we just experienced and, and someone's screaming and someone is almost crying. It's like, what was that? And that was, and that was her last physical performance like that I mean she was she just that was the last performance of Martha Graham and we knew at that moment without even saying anything like I just saw magic I saw the I saw the passion of the human form happen I mean and it, it keeps you alive my my teacher one of my mentors uh, Marnie Wood I performed with her last summer and she was doing a piece called flower fiction at the Ailey Center and she wanted to do the three stages of her life 
So she chose Stuart Hodes, he's 88 years old, he's the last remaining male dancer who partnered with Martha. Then she chose me, I'm 52, and so I was the middle-aged guy. And then she chose this 36-year-old dancer, Oliver Tobin, to be her youth. And so we're all, she's doing the stages of her life. She's 78. When in rehearsal, she just run at me full speed, jump on my leg, hinge down to the ground, expect, I mean, it, 78. I mean, she does knee work, she, she'll show you up. So, <laughs> so it's, you know, it, it does, it, 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 Martha Graham technique done correctly will make you last. Incorrectly will damage you within a week. So, and that's why, so my whole premise as to how I teach the Graham technique is purely from a biomechanical kinesiological standpoint. Like, I don't, I don't need the drama, I don't need the emotion at all. Let's, let's just start with the physics of it and then we start to put intent on top of that. So that's, that was one of the reasons that to a certain degree I believe that I got the job, you know, so. So your plate seems pretty full, but I'm wondering, it seems like it's part of a bigger vision that you have. I, I, want to go. I have a huge... Where is the vision going? The vision for me is actually to take technology and actually get it back to reality rather than staying in technology. You know what I mean? It's like I don't just want kids to just look at an avatar and play the avatar. I want the avatar to be a springboard for what they can do in real space. And I think that once you, it's like game theory, when you're, you're tricking them with their own game. Because right now I think contemporary society, I think, I think our kids, my, son, my you know, sons, are so uh, addicted to virtual digital reality that, that we, how are we going to pull them back out? Well, let's say, let, let's say, uh, let's say you have to do, I, I'm going to institute a system, you've got to do so many push-ups for so many, you know, for so many minutes or something like that. Or let's do a game where it's a combination of figure out something in virtual space and now go out and make it happen. Then go out and make it happen in reality. Or a mixture of the two. We, you know, at this point, we can, we're getting, virtual reality is coming back again. You know how it just, it, get, it was too freaky for people, I think. Virtual reality, when it came out, freaked people out a little. They weren't ready for it. But now we're getting to that point where virtual reality, we're not going to just sit and pretend and toggle stuff. We're going to be virtual reality where you're moving around and you're fighting those demons but, that you're seeing them, but you are physically moving. So that synthesis, yeah, I'm hoping to be a part of that because I, I, I think we've gone pretty heavily into this sedate only mental virtual place and I would like to get some visceral uh, visceral inter interaction so to me that's that and just physical education for, for kids is a huge passion for me the fact that a kid my son who's 11 can list every last weapon on Call of Duty and every last range of what you do for whatever situation and yet doesn't know what his bicep is and he doesn't know the muscles that got him to school that's a problem. I mean, it really is. And so we, there's these, I, I brought in a, an interactive functional anatomy program to, to, for his, uh, when he was in first grade, and the ooh factor, when the kids saw the muscles and saw the bones and all this, that ooh factor, we need to manipulate that and get these kids excited about the vehicle that they're walking around in before they throw a baseball, before they catch a football. You know what I mean? It's like, this is your vehicle. Get, get, get used to driving it better. You know, I work with these athletes and they, we, you know, they, they are, it's a game because I can do more push-ups than any of them. Like, you, the, the strongest athletes, and they just don't get it. And so then, it, so I'm saying to them, look, I'm a, I have a Volkswagen and I'm a really good driver, right? You guys are Maseratis and you're okay driving, right? So this thing, if you take your Maserati and you learn how to drive that, and they're all getting the metaphor and one guy goes, I'm a Bentley. <laughs> I'm like, you be that as it may, that's right. But you, we gotta teach you how to drive that. So, so we do these push-up games, and so then they'll go and they'll keep challenging me and challenging me, and this one guy, Jesse Montgomery, he was almost get it, and then he thought he was gonna win, and then he finally collapsed out, and I just went back up, did four more. Oh. And I just hovered one inch off the floor, and I looked at him like, are we good? <laughs> He's like, we're good, we're good, we're good. So, I mean, it is, it's, and it's not magic. It's just, it really, it really is gaming the system, you know? We can, we, we're doing so much gaming this exterior system and politic and money and commodification. Let's, let's, let's game what we're here in, you know? So that's, to answer your question, yeah, that's, I gotta, my greater passion is that. The, the rest of this stuff, a lot of this stuff is just fun. It's just fun stuff. But that, that's something, if I was to leave a mark, it's like, we gotta, we gotta change that. We've been writing on it too long, and, and I think coaches are starting to, well, first of all, with the whole concussion awareness, that's one of the first steps, taking a greater responsibility for these games we play. Well, at the same time, we're not even talking about all these perpetuated injuries and in, in ligament damage. No one's talking about that, and these guys are limping around the rest of their life. But yeah, they got a lot of money, but what good is money if you every day wake up feeling terrible? Right? So that, that, a lot of that can be uh, the knowledge of how to run that system from the beginning will keep you healthier longer. So, yeah, there you go. I mean, that's truly a passionate thought. When you're, um, you're talking about uh, athletes and dance, uh, I'm wondering, Lillian, you know, you're the one that got this thing going. Um, 
Well, these, this part of their, their, it's part of their culture. I mean, it, their culture is to, to understand impact and weight and shift. I mean, if you go look at the cultural dancers, that's what it is. And the whole sense of shift of weight, uh, understanding how to change their pelvis. If you go look, if you look at the, the dancing, they understand the driving with their pelvis. Western culture doesn't know how to understand driving with this pelvis. As a matter of fact, we're told not to move it. <laughs> Arms and legs. You know, and so I was, I mean, I was messing around with the basketball players and I, and, and cause I'm talking about mobility in the lower back and I said, well, get by me and he'd go to run and I would just shift the pelvis and be in front, shift the pelvis and, be, and it astounds them and it, because they generally move like Legos. They're the whole thing is moving. They're fast Legos, right? But you know, they're just, they're still, they're still moving like Legos. So let's get some, you know, let's get some sinew going in there. Yeah. Mixing, mixing aesthetics, mixing some t sense of movement, non-traditional movement with athleticism is, is it, it can only help. And again, that's that by cross pollinating. Yes, we stay healthier by, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 the gene pool grows when you get that much cross. Well, the same thing happens with information. So how does your system relate to like another mother of uh, the, the, the motion capture people that are using, you know, the, the sensors on the, on, on the bodies that are moving and right. they're taking all that. How does your, how does your system relate to that? I mean, well, it's, it, it's, it won't be using the reflective balls. Right. So in other words, you're not, you're not encumbered with the suit. Yes. And the, uh, the other one is, is that if you take, it's a type of motion capture, but you're infrared depth mapping and you know pressure-wise where they landed. Once you create that avatar, it truly is them. And so then you can start to look at the data of you, this person tends to put too much pressure on the outside of their foot each time they walk. And so then it basically then, well, if that, that's the case, then if you contract just a little bit more in this lower abdominal, you're going to change that line and your walk will start to become more smooth. So it's really, it's slowing down the data. As a kinesiologist, I see somebody walk and already I have analysis. Well, why don't we have an, a, a computer is going to be a lot faster than I am. So we start to create a database, this map, because we just got the supercomputer for, for campus. Yeah, we now have a high performance computer with $9 million that we bought from the Navy, right? And we call it the mainframe, right? M-A-N-E, kind of kitschy, but mainframe. Mm -hmm. um, and so this project requires high performance computing, but at the same time, creating a database for human movement. Like we're talking a full, anything you've ever seen someone do becomes part of the database of this computer. So it can start to extrapolate, well, we fix this guy by doing this. Well, maybe this guy needs this. So the larger we make that library, the same way it's in coding, coding it's called OpenGL. It's this giant library of what's already been done. Well, I'm hoping to make an OpenGL of the human body. So it's, it's, it, it will be a digitized version of reality as it were, but to bring it back into reality, not just to like stay out there in the digitized world. So it's, it, you know, it can be output as an avatar, it can be output as kinesiological text, it can be output as a prescription of when you go home tonight as you bend over, make sure you turn your hip a little to the right or you're going to keep on irritating that hip flexor. I mean, these little adjustments make a difference in our lives, huge, and yet we're just not educated about it. We're not. Here's, hey, go take some Vicodin, good night. Oh, absolutely. I mean, one can do that even without the database. I mean, you can go look at the forces and all that, but I mean, but you could recreate that in virtual space and say, well, had you been able to do this? I mean, in the end, there's, there's so many injuries that cannot be averted, particularly when you're traveling at 15 miles per hour and you weigh 300 pounds. I mean, it's, you know, that, that's football is football. But before the impact, there's so many things that one can work with. Yeah. But I mean, in the end, certain things are, you know, MMA is MMA. <laughs> it's, you know. Well, we have about five minutes left. Um, can you, do you know the, your screening time? And My screening time is, uh, it is October 18th. That's a, that's a Saturday night. It's uh, 8.15 to 10.15 and it goes with a uh, Fallen Angel 2, who's a previous uh, choreographer who passed away just this last year, uh, Bruce Wood. So it's, uh, I, I believe it was originally a documentary and then they've now added, since his death, they've, they've added more material to it. So it's, uh, uh, it's kind of tough to have mine with that because I think that one's going to be very emotionally charged. So uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it'll be, I think it's going to be a pretty intense evening. <laughs> And that's at Angelica. And that's the Angelica Film yeah. Center, sorry. Yeah. One last question, and I, wish, I waited at the end on purpose on this. 
What's the state of your macadamia farm? Um, well, we had to sell that to survive. So we uh, we were uh, well. It's, the state of it is it's beautiful. We sold it to a couple that uh, um, uh, a gynecologist and her husband, and uh, they they love it. I mean, I built it. I built it to flesh out at least over like a like a seven year period. And they just keep calling back and sending me Facebook photos of like oh, you wouldn't believe this. You wouldn't believe this. I'm like, yeah, I would. <laughs> it's like I plan it. I would believe it. So basically, it's because uh, the way I did it when I started with 100. 44 macadamia trees, I went in and took out 86 of them, like me and two chainsaws. So that's how I got rid of my, all of my aggression about politics. Like I, I took down 86 trees and it, it took about eight weeks and then chipping it all and it was one day I just put, this, put them down and I thought, I'm good, I'm good, I, you know, I feel better. But uh, no, but we sculpted the land. I, I told a guy I could drive a bulldozer and I rented a bulldozer. It was a six foot wide D3 and I moved a thousand cubic yards. So I, car I carved it to back into the hill and uh, basically just played Tonka and just made two different watersheds for two different houses and uh, was only able to build the one, but they will be building the main house because the original plan was a main house, a smaller house, which I built, and a farm, I mean a farmhouse because it's an it's a ag zone property. So it was meant to be a three generation property. So they're, they're, they're going to carry on the vision. It just, it just it was, I wasn't in the league to Ford doing something like that. I thought I was, but you can only build so much, you know. Yes, yes it is. But it, it, it doesn't, you know, in the, in the long count, so, so I, if I lost my life savings that was around $500,000, if all three of my kids go to SMU, I'm basically 100000 ahead. So, <laughs> so, so if, if the short count doesn't look good. Not at all. The long count, I'm good. I'm good. But even that one's like waffling because my son, who's like, oh, I don't want to go to SMU. I'm like, what? <laughs> So, so anyhow, we're, 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 he's finally getting it, so we're applying, he's applying for SMU uh, this coming week, actually. Yeah, so you got to look at the long count, that's, 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 my, uh, that's my philosophy. Anything yeah. you want to add? No, I'm just super, I'm so thankful for, for you to invite my film. I'm super, super excited and just uh, to have, I mean, it, to me, I've, I've wanted to be a filmmaker forever since I was a little kid. Ever, I mean, I'll just, I've, there's a video of me that my dad was taking and I'm just like, can I run the camera, dad? Can I run it, please? And he's like, oh, and I just, I look back at that video and I realized I just had this passion. So I, I, I always wanted to make movies. So maybe I'm heading in that direction. So this is almost a movie, right? A documentary, <laughs> the Burning Man documentary will be more a mixture of both documentation and more just also just the chronicling these very interesting people that are the various subsets of the dancers that go up to the burn. You've got the, the club ravers, you've got the contact improvers, and you have these conscious, very passionate conscious dance ecstatic dance group. And they are three very different constituencies that evolved over the process of the burn. Originally it was just like drive-by shooting range and blowing up propane tanks. There's this, you, didn't go, you didn't go up to the burn to dance, right? And, and now 70,000 people go there and if you ask them, did you dance while you were there, probably about 60 of thousand of them will say yes. So it is, the dance has it as, as an organism, a cultural meme has grown throughout the process of that event. So I'm trying to document that and I followed a opulent temple camp, uh, contact camp and a camp called Camp Rhythm Wave. So over a four year period to kind of document how these people slowly evolved even in a, in a very short window compared to the fact that it's been up at the burn, up at the desert for 25 years. So mm -hmm. to me that, that, and that's, to me that's fun. I mean that's just, that's melding my, uh, my art side, because I think the Burning Man Festival is one of the greatest gifts to the, to the world ever, because it's a place where you can be a 52-year-old dancer and you're not the creeper who's trying to dance with a 20-year-old girl. <laughs> no, we're in a society where you're not allowed to dance, right? And if you do, you're a weirdo. You know, and, and so they're up there, you could be, my sister went this year, I didn't get to go, she's 60, and she's, you know, emailing me things like, I danced with these people out at the fence, and this art car came up, and, you know, she's, she's, she's not that kind of crazy artist, she's a nurse, midwife, you know, gynecologist, right? And she was just, she loved it. I mean, it's the kind of thing where when you can take all ages, all cultures, and no matter what the bond is, if I see you, you're my brother. And it does, and that's, that's, that's one of the rule sets. If someone wrecks up there on a bike, people converge. Someone wrecks here on a bike, I'm like, oh, I can't deal with that, liability, you know. And so to me, I, I want to spread that gospel, as it were. And that's, and I just, you know, that's, that to me is both fun, but again, mixing my artist, my, my altruist, uh, and then my, my dancing camera abilities all together. So that's, the, that's next up. So everybody come, come to the burn next year and you can see the premiere. All right. <laughs>